Well, this is a thrill. This is a, an absolute thrill. Joining us is the Reverend Barry W. Lynn. For nearly a quarter of a century, he ran Americans United for separation of church and state. He is an attorney and a member of the Supreme Court Bar. If that's not good enough, if that's not good enough, he is also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. We get two for the price of one and... In the background, it's his wife, who's a doctor. So maybe we'll even get three for the price of one. This is, as as <laughs> I've heard, such a deal is what I've heard. Welcome, sir. Nice to be back. Well, I want to talk to you about the Dominion lawsuit, the Dominion voting machine lawsuit against Fox News. They're suing Fox for $1.6 billion for defamation. I want to know how easy it is to sue for defamation here in the United States, what they're up against. And then I want to talk to you as a minister about lying and greed and the morality of Fox News and people like Tucker Carlson. Let me play you a clip of Tucker Carlson on Dave Rubin's show. I believe this was two years ago before Tucker realized he was going to have to put his hand on a Bible and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. This is Tucker Carlson talking to uh, Dave Rubin. I mean, I lie. If I'm really cornered or something, I lie. I really try not to. I try never to lie on TV. I, try, I just don't, you know, I don't like lying. I certainly do it, you know, out of weakness or whatever. <laughs> weakness. What a great excuse for lying. Um, Tucker Carlson, um, someone sent me a note to try to convince me to boycott watching Tucker Carlson. <laughs> and I wrote her back and I said, not only... Do I never watch him now? But even when I used to be on his shows, I would tape the shows and then I have a lot of them in a safe deposit box, but I don't, I didn't even watch them. Sometimes you want to watch yourself, see how you go. With him, it was a total waste of time. So you have met him? Oh, I met him many times, both, uh, you know, kind of wandering around Washington and, uh, also on his various television shows, people forget that he was fired by CNN. He was a short-lived co-host with Bill Press on MSNBC. He got th thrown off of even Dancing with the Stars because he basically didn't even move. So that's three firings in a row. So now when people say, well, will Rupert Murdoch possibly fire Tucker Carlson? Well, he certainly should, because to get to your question of defamation, defamation is very difficult to prove. You have to demonstrate that the person who says something that is false knew or at least had a reasonable belief that he might be not telling the truth. Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity have all admitted now in their depositions to uh, in the lawsuit that they knew things were not as they were saying on the air. They admit that they didn't believe what they were saying. That should be a slam dunk, even under libel and defamation laws in the United States, which is pretty tough. I mean, if, if uh, somebody uh, sued you for saying uh, – you know, Barry Lynn's rather, what a schmuck. I'd never, I'd never win a lawsuit. Even and I should. Because I have certifiable. Ethanol. Yes, you do. <laughs> I sent you, you got the package in the yes. mail. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was. Um, well, let me, uh, you're, I, you're, go you're ahead. A so this is a civil lawsuit mm -hmm. and we're in the discovery phase where Fox News has to turn over all the evidence that the judge will allow. And there are depositions that are taken. And when you're deposed during the discovery phase, you are sworn in on a Bible? 
Uh, no, I don't believe so. Uh, not in the District of Columbia, where I was deposed only once. Is it? Is but it a crime? You don't even have to say anything. You can have a lawyer present at a deposition. And if you don't like a question that the person from the other party asks you, you can turn to your attorney and say, should I answer that? And a lawyer should have said here, uh, you don't have to answer that. That goes in the record that you didn't answer it, but you don't have to say anything. Why would Rupert Murdoch during this deposition say that he thought Joe Biden won and that his anchor people went a little too far? Why would Sean Hannity during the deposition say he didn't for one second believe that Sidney Powell was telling the truth? Why would Tucker Carlson admit that he didn't think Biden lost. lost. Why, why would they say that if they're not uh, under threat of being charged with perjury? Can, can you be charged with perjury in a deposition? I don't think so. I don't really know the answer to that. Well, why do um, people feel obliged? I mean, apparently Fox News was spooked by these lawyers. Why are they telling the, the truth? I think part of it might be this sense that I don't know Rupert Murdoch. I've never okay. even met him. Once I know you, these other once three. You get to, once you get to a court of law, once yeah. you, then you have to tell the truth. Then you have to tell the truth. Then you are asked to swear and some of enlightened right. uh, states. Uh, you can affirm that you're going to tell the truth. So you the, don't have to say anything, but you can't lie on the stand. You so, can't do what Alex, Alex Murdaugh did for the last two weeks. By the way, I owe you an apology. I started reading up on Alex. You're absolutely right. I was wrong. It's a fascinating. It is emblematic it is. of everything <laughs> in America. It is. It is. It's like the OJ trial. But yep. going back, the lawyers are telling Fox executives and the anchor people, tell Tell the truth because you're going to have to tell the truth on the stand, especially since there's so much damnable evidence, these texts and such, right? That's right. That's right. Go ahead. So, But they would say that, but but the, the sense that these, the three people who are on air lying constantly, they think they're above the law or they think no matter what they said, um, it doesn't matter. Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity, and Tucker Carlson in particular are such wealthy people that they figure they can con anybody. And in the event that they were fired, all of them can live in the lap of luxury or in Sean Hannity's case, in the laps of a woman that he wasn't married to. But those are the things that you feel so em empowered to do anything, to say anything when you're in those positions. It's the same thing when, when you look at uh, uh, Cuomo, who got fired from CNN for doing things that were totally unethical, practicing with his brother, the governor of the state of New York, what to say, how to play it out, how to try to survive. It is impossible those are most people. Those to, are journalist. To, those are journalistic ethics at play. Is it against the law, though, for Chris Cuomo to advise his brother on how to spin the sexual harassment yeah. or sexual assault allegations? It probably isn't against the law in the state of New York to do that. But again. He signed a contract. I suspect that there was in the contract certain he was signing certain representations for what he would do and wouldn't do. And this was probably one of them. He would not coach per people about what to say, whether they were going to be on as a guest or they were members of his family. Right. And Don Lemon allegedly coached Jesse Smollett. And so 
Are these journalists or are these people, these are personalities more than journalists, aren't they? Yeah, these are not journalists. I mean, when Tucker Carlson got complete access to the uh, dozens of hours of tapes of what happened on January 6th, he's even now trying to spin that as if by selectively showing a few frames at a time, he is trying to convince, and I'm sure will actually convince a huge number of people who watch Fox News that these were tourists. Maybe a couple of them were a little rowdy, but if you see those and they're playing them on every network now, he has people looking at a glass case that contains some documents, you know, that I've walked past dozens of times, or people in lines getting into the Capitol. This is nonsense. This is complete idiocy. There so, is nothing. We saw it. We saw it. I was I was nearly in tears when I saw that because I have been in that building so many times and in the Capitol and in the chambers. It was of course a, it was an insurrection. It, it is it is the temple of democracy as a minister. I'm being serious. And as a member of the Supreme Court bar, when you walk into the Capitol, it it's the last best hope as as flawed and corrupt as it is. If you believe in a republic and a democracy and people running, uh, having destiny over their own fate, you it's built like a temple. It is. And, uh, you know, my very favorite politician of all times was uh, uh, Senator Lowell Weicker when he was a Republican, even uh, in the United States Senate representing Connecticut. And if I had a dollar for every time he told me this one thing, I'd be wealthy. Barry, never forget that the Senate is the last best hope for democracy. It is not the Supreme Court. And of course, in his day, when he was in the Senate, the Supreme Court looked pretty reasonable. Now, it's a total fraud. There is no one in her or his right mind who believes that the three people put on the Supreme Court by Donald J. Trump are anything other than lousy lawyers. Now, let me me, sidebar here. A sidebar, please. Yes. You're, as a minister, I'm going to you're wearing your ministerial hat here. Yes, I am. Not, not like a minister, like, not like a prime minister. This is like a no, it, it, the, the hat. It, it's a it's a plug actually f- for a beer company. Oh, OK. So but I don't drink beer. So uh, we, don't call, we don't call them ministers like they do in Great Britain. Right. 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 And we call it a temple of democracy, not a church of democracy. Right. Am I being paranoid that it's been designed when people are angry with Washington, they blame the Jews by calling it a temple of democracy and not a church of democracy? They don't call senators, you know, ministers the way they do in in Great Britain. It's like the... uh, it's like almost like the like Pontius Pilate washing his hands of the whole thing and just letting exactly the Jews take care of it so they can be. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, every temple uh, is not a Christian entity, and, and there are a lot of temples to gods and goddesses in the Roman Empire right. and Greece. But so I, you may be a little off on that. Okay, one, but all right. So no, it, what do you? It th- is. What, it is a or? very important place. As you know, you cannot go, you know this as well as anyone, you cannot go into parts of the Capitol unless you have and can prove you have the authority to be there. Exactly. Yeah. First Amendment lawyer Floyd Abrams thinks the way you do. I believe he said this looks pretty bad for Fox News. Yes, I uh, believe he does believe that. And I think it's true. And under he's a normal first, circumstances. He's a, first, he's a big First Amendment guy. He's oh, like, absolutely. Absolutely no. I mean, wouldn't it be great if there is a God, and I do believe there is a God, uh, all you hear from 
the right wing is about freedom of speech, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. It would be so great to have <laughs> Fox News have to cough up one point six billion dollars for the freedom of speech. There are limits to freedom of speech. How is it defamation, though? They defamed. Well, they did. Well, well, the the object of the defamation in this lawsuit is that one company, not. It's, it's not a generic, they defamed I don't know, viewers or something. It's, right. it's, it's about one voting machine company. Under normal circumstances, this would be settled. Fox would come up and say, we'll give you $500 million. Just go away. I don't think that's going to happen because I think – that Dominion will feel that it has these characters dead to rights and that they can possibly get all of the $1.6 billion that they're seeking. It's an astronomical amount. It's hard to believe in unless you're a defense contractor that there's maybe not much money floating around. But, mm-hmm. but this would be it would be a travesty for them to settle for anything less than a trial that awards juries don't like to give a billion dollars, but closer to that than to a half a million, which I think is where you would start a negotiation. Will a check for if they win, would a check for one point six billion dollars be written during Rupert Murdoch's lifetime. He's 90. Well, I suspect if he's made it to 90, he'll probably make it till 95. And yes, I, d- I do believe the check would be written. The um, We're still, you know, everybody's trying to figure out what happened to Alex Jones. Is, uh, uh, he, I forget how much he, he owed when, in those close two to, lawsuits. Close to a billion. You know? Yeah, close. And yeah. I, I just noticed that he sold a um, hundred it's like a two hundred thousand dollar property in California today, so you know he's Which he's living property? okay. A pro- much- it was a house in California for how much? I maybe I think he I think it was sold for two hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars. That sticks in my mind, but I didn't That's write right. it down. I mean, Therefore, I don't remember. Now let's go to the first what. That's a lot of money, but not a lot of money. I no, mean, it's not a lot of money when you're fifty million. <laughs> the um, here's the one thing the right has right about the First Amendment. They have almost everything wrong. But today, Chuck Schumer, for some inexplicable reason, is being interviewed from his office on CNN and announces that it is one it is a job, a requirement of the United States Senate to oversee the news media and to tell people like Rupert Murdoch and these hosts, I think it's the first time he's probably ever mentioned uh, Tucker Carlson's name in an interview, but that he, he said that our job is to oversee this. That is not their job. The right wing is so wrong so many times. But if you go on any right wing website, you'll see this little clip and you'll see Schumer talking about how it is the responsibility of the Senate to make sure that the media tells the truth. And my first encounter with with Schumer, when he the first day, I think he was elected to Congress, he calls me up. He saw a, a uh, an op-ed in the New York Times by my boss at the time, Ira Glasser of the ACLU. He said, I'd like you to come over. I just want to talk to you about libel. I sat down. It was just him, just he and I. We were there for 45 minutes or an hour. And he's at the end of it, he said, so you don't think I can make it easier for public officials to prevail in libel cases? And I said, you're right. I'm not, you haven't changed my mind and my boss was right and I'm right. But during those times in the Trump years, when Trump was talking about finding a way to make it 
easier for him to recover from the salacious things said about him. I, in the back of my mind, I kept thinking Schumer would be – he would be open to listening to that. Well, He when, wasn't. But when you testify before Congress – yeah. You put your you raise your right hand or left? Yes. Is so it the right, right hand? The right yeah. hand. Yeah. I'm a lefty. And <laughs> you swear to tell the truth and you can be charged with perjury. Yes, you can. And you there are constraints, that is to say, that there are times at which you or your lawyer would say, My client is not prepared to answer that question, but you can't answer the question in a way that you know to be false. And so one of the things I talked about earlier this week on the show, if you want to arrive at what the truth is, have people swear in a Bible, pay attention to congressional hearings. You're, you're most likely to hear the truth, I think, during a congressional hearing. Is that true? I'll tell you, no, I, I don't think so, because... Good, I was worried. I, I was worried I <laughs> you said something correct. No, um, rarely wrong. The problem with these hearings is, and you can see this in the House when you watch these nitwit Republicans who are now the chair of the Judiciary Committee, the Intelligence Committee, asking questions. Most times that you testify, and I testified generally before the Judiciary Committee in both the House and the Senate, but you, you were lucky to get through your five minute statement before people are interrupting you and never stopping. So Jim Jordan, when he was on the Judiciary Minority, I would testify and I would, that Jerry Nadler was the chair and he'd let me get my whole five minute thing in. And then Jim Jordan would just start talking and Louis Gohmert, they, they just start talking about whatever it was on their mind so that you didn't even get a question to answer or you got kind of stupid answers. But the problem is, why don't citizens have a right to speak before the Congress, not to a committee, not to a committee that is going to interrupt you or half of them are going to interrupt you. There ought to be a way for people to make a statement, not a 30 second statement, but a 15 minute statement about the issues, because nine out of 10 chances, those people in the fields in which they're experts know more than any combination of members of the House or even the Senate committees, they just do. Tell me, uh, going back to Dominion, if they rule in favor, there's not going to be a summary judgment where the judge just no, awards. No, they're asking for it, but they will not That's get not it. Gonna happen. Okay, so the jury awards $1.6 and it's paid. What are the consequences? Are there any? Does it matter? Well... Yeah, I don't know enough about the finances of Fox. No, no, I'm not talking about the your... finances, oh. the reputation. Do, do you no. then fire the anchor people? Is there bloodletting? Does the audience suddenly say, oh, I cannot trust? No, Fox? I do not believe the audience will ever go. Those people have been sucked in to a system which they believed then and believe today. They're not stopping to watch uh, well they did Dr. stop Carlson. they they did stop watching we've learned through the discovery that they stopped watching fox news after fox called the election for biden and you have this yeah. zoom meeting it's incredible where brett bear is yeah. saying we've hurt <laughs> our audience's feelings they're distraught we've yeah. let them down and we have to reverse. Maybe we should reverse the call and say the election is still up in the air <laughs> yeah. because they're watching Newsmax. Yeah. Which well, Newsmax and, and One America News are 
short-lived phenomena. One of the big uh, satellite providers dumped one already, and they're being accused of being censored just because they they won't carry something. It's as if if you demanded that this show twice a week was on Newsmax, you could demand anything you wouldn't right. you want, but they'd have a First Amendment to say. No, we're not taking well, you. I, I'm not. I'm not that cruel. I would never want to inflict. No, I didn't think so. <laughs> the so Tucker, Car you know, I always try to figure out why are people doing this. Why is Tucker Carlson doing this? And then I, I realized uh, there's money to be made in annoying people, in getting pe like he is so dead inside. And so unpatriotic and so mercenary and so hateful. You know, his mother hated him. That mm -hmm. came out of the New York Times. Mother abandoned him when he was like yeah. six and then, you know, left him out of the will. So his mother, you know, you can't, if your mother hates you, that informs a lot of <laughs> your worldview. Yes, it, it certainly does. So he's, and, del um, he's I, delighting in the outrage, right? He's not upset. Yeah. He, he's doing this because he knows people are going to get upset. He does. But in order for him to get on television, he, in his first book, he wrote several books about his so-called life. And he, uh, he writes that uh, the first time he was invited on, I believe on Fox, it was with Clifford Alexander, who was in the head of the, uh, of the army, secretary of the army. And he admits in the book that he didn't know anything about the topic, but he figured that if he went on television, that would propel him into cable television. And it did, it did. Is He is not a smart person. He he is he may or may not be smarter than Sean Hannity, but I don't think so. But he went from be Tucker Carlson used to be a normal conservative kind of fringy character, but he wasn't the incendiary fascist that he has become over the last three or four years. He used to be a conservative. I can deal with conservatives. I dealt with Pat Buchanan on the radio for a year and a half. I dealt with Ollie North for, for uh, years on Friday afternoons. But he is just a nut. And people believe him. And I hope maybe sometime we can get the Hirschenfelds on with me to talk about what it is that makes a person seem to believe that they can get away with lying and knowing that they're lying. It's not like he just reads right wing materials. He's making it up. It's Why the, do people do I that? I know you have to talk to your publisher. I do. It is public, that would be the publisher of the soon-to-be-released Paid to Piss People Off, Volume 1, Peace, Volume 2, Porn, Volume 3, Prayer. And I'll give you full detailed information about how you can pre-order it next week on this program. Fantastic. The Thank Reverend you. Barry W. Lynn. Follow him on Twitter at Barry W. Lynn. Go to BarryWLynn.com. And how do you pre-order the book? Um, I'm going to have uh, – there's a pre-order glitch that I think you and I talked about probably off air last week, but it continues. And uh, so something like 67 people were able to – to get it, and then it started shutting down. And as of a few hours ago, they were still having problems with it. So we'll plug, we'll plug it next week. Perfect. Really hard. Thank you. Okay, no. Give Thank my you. Best, give my best to the doctor. Thank you. I certainly will. Stay Have any advice for me? Stay out of trouble. Only good trouble. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. I think I might have something. I'm not sure. Hi, I'm David Feldman. This is The Mop Up. If you're an attorney handling the Dominion voting machine lawsuit, the defamation lawsuit against Fox News, I think I might have something for you. I think it's something that you might uh, be interested in. It's Tucker Carlson 
testif- not testifying. This was two years ago before he thought that he had to testify. This is him on that idiot Dave Rubin's show. I don't know if you know who Dave Rubin is. If you don't, you're lucky. But here is Tucker Carlson on Dave Rubin's show being honest. This was two years ago before he ever had to swear on a Bible and tell the truth. This is Tucker Carlson. I mean, I lie. Okay. Uh, Continue. I mean, I lie. If I'm really cornered or something, I lie. I really try not to. I try never to lie on TV. I I just don't, you know, I don't like lying. I certainly do it, you know, out of weakness or whatever. You do it out of weakness. Or, you know, if you're afraid the ratings are dipping after the 2020 presidential elections and you want to re-burnish the brand, so... I mean, I lie. Yes, of course, you lie. You admitted to Dave Rubin before you realized that anybody was actually going to sue Fox News for $1.6 billion. Tucker Carlson told the truth and said... I mean, I lie. Yeah, you told the truth. Okay, just thought I'd share that with the lawyers for Dominion. The trial starts, I think, next month, $1.6 billion. And they should keep in mind that Tucker Carlson actually admitted. I mean, I lie. Yeah, you do lie for profit. There are roughly three train derailments per day in the United States. On Tuesday in Ohio, again, a Norfolk Southern conductor was killed when his train hit a dump truck carrying limestone. That would be Norfolk Southern's third railway accident in Ohio in little more than a month. People who work our railroads need sleep, paid sick leave, paid medical leave for their well-being And as we saw in East Palestine, Ohio, our well-being. Joe Biden repeatedly insists he's the most pro-union president in American history, even though this is the same man whose very first 2020 presidential campaign fundraiser was hosted by Stephen Cousin, founder of the union-busting law firm Cousin O'Connor, rotten hell, Stephen Cousin from the union busting law firm, Cousin O'Connor. I think they're out of Philadelphia and they're big Joe Biden supporters. Nice, right? After President Biden signed a congressional resolution on December 2nd, 2022, forcing railway workers to accept their new contract, Democrats celebrated Thanks to Biden's stewardship, they insisted, a catastrophic nationwide strike had been averted. Perhaps if there had been a catastrophic nationwide railway strike, which resulted in a contract with paid sick leave and better scheduling, that catastrophic chemical spill in East Palestine, Ohio, as well as all those other catastrophic derailments around the country and in Ohio this year, perhaps all those catastrophic derailments could have been averted had there been a catastrophic nationwide railway strike. If you're on the side of labor, you recognize America needs a series of catastrophic nationwide strikes until the bosses are finally reminded of who the real boss is. You mean like in France? We, precisely. France has a life expectancy that's 83, while in America, it's down to 77. They live five years longer than we do in France. France's retirement age is 62. A new proposal to raise it resulted in millions of French people taking to the streets this week. They protest, which is why, compared to America and France, their health care is practically free. 
Why, by the way, that's Marie Antoinette's head after it was taken off. Why does France have so much and the USA so little? Well, every couple of days, the French workers shut it all down. It's not quite the creative destruction that economist Joseph Schumpeter had in mind, but I can assure you shutting it all down is the best thing for worker efficiency. Shut it all down. Based on GDP per hour worked, based on GDP per hour worked, France has a higher productivity rate than America. Let me repeat that, okay? Based on GDP per hour worked, France has a higher productivity rate than America. And with all those strikes, France's economy, despite a population of only 67 million, they only have a population of 67 million, it is still the seventh largest in the world. The dirty, dark secret supply siders don't want you to know here in America is that a country can have an enormous GDP even when they share it with all their citizens. As a matter of fact, especially when they share it with all their citizens. Our GDP is not as great as it was before Reagan and the supply siders took over. So we, 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 a series of nationwide strikes just like France had this week. In Paris, a strike is like bad weather. You learn to adjust. I know France has problems, but when it comes to important things, like how long do you live and do you want to keep on living, the French are way, way better off than we are here in America because nationwide strikes are good for your health. Americans are warned a nationwide strike will cripple the economy. Folks, when nearly half of us can't come up with a thousand dollars for an emergency, it sounds like our economy is already crippled. We here in America are warned that a nationwide strike would grind all commerce to a halt. You mean no more monthly beauty boxes from Allure magazine? <laughs> How will I survive if I don't get my monthly beauty box from Allure magazine? Granted, a nationwide strike means Americans would be out of work. But you have to remember that when you're out of work, that means you do not have to work. I remember the writer skills strike. It was the happiest couple of months of my professional writing career because I didn't have to go to work. Work sucks, by the way. All work sucks. Whatever serious economic hardship a nationwide strike here in America temporarily imposes, it would be nothing compared to the bounty of higher wages and better working conditions that a nationwide strike would quickly harvest. And if you don't believe me, rewind this and see how much better the French are by constantly striking and cutting off Marie Antoinette's head. I think that was uh, not saying we should do that because they already did it to Marie Antoinette. It would be stupid to sew Marie Antoinette's head back on just so you could place it under a guillotine and slice it off again. So I'm not advocating bringing out the guillotine. I'm not. Although I don't know if I would necessarily stop anybody. No, I would. I have no violence. But, you know, no violence. But strikes are not violent. You'll notice nobody was getting killed in France. They don't have guns. That's why nobody was killed. Where are the strikes here in America? 
Where are the strikes? We are told America is undergoing a golden age of labor activism. Gallup, the pollster, reports America's approval rate for unions is the highest since 1965. Americans are in love with the idea of unions. Not since 1965 has our love affair with unions been this strong. So where are the strikes? At first glance, you might think that union activism is on the rise. For example, last year, union work stoppages were the highest since 2005, right? Starbucks workers staged 107 individual strikes. 48,000 University of California employees walked off their jobs. And while this seems like something, it amounts to absolutely nothing. America has, now write this down, do the math here. America has 131 million full-time workers. But last year, a grand total of only 222,000 of them went on strike. Do the math. 131 million full-time workers, 222,000 of whom went on strike. That's just 70,000 more Americans who were struck by a bullet. Not too many strikes here in America. And because Americans don't strike, because we don't seize control of the economy's on-off switch, we are miserable. We're miserable. 50% of U.S. workers feel stressed out on a daily basis. That's according to CNBC. 41% of American workers say their job is a constant source of worry. It's not the way your mother toilet trained you. That's not why you're miserable. It's not because your father didn't love you. It's because your job sucks. 22% of American workers say their job makes them sad, while 18% say it makes them angry. We didn't know our jobs were making us sick in the head until COVID lockdowns provided some perspective for us to see just how much unnecessary bullshit comes with a paycheck. And so 2022 ushered in the great resignation with employers to this day still complaining it's difficult to find workers. Why are American workers not sticking around these horrible jobs and fighting? Why aren't they fighting For dignity and higher wages, what's with this great resignation? Why are they quitting instead of choosing to stay and fight? Because they're quitting because you can't do it without solidarity. You can't do it without unions, which still, which are still, still on the decline, despite all this sugarcoating that union activism and labor activism is on the rise. The fact is union membership reached an all-time low in 2022. The American worker needs a strong union movement, like in France. And the only way for unions to be strong and popular is by electing union leaders willing to shut it all down and shutting it all down. Americans crave action. They will respect a union that shuts it all down. If Republicans, if Republicans are willing to shut down our government over raising the debt ceiling, and they have shut down our government over the debt ceiling in the past, if they are willing to shut down the government and become heroes among their own. Well, our side, we need unions and Democrats willing to shut down the economy until it works for everyone. They want to shut down the government? Fine. We're going to shut down their economy. 
And that means unions should only support candidates who will support unions when unions decide it's time to shut it all down. And you need to shut it all down like they do in France. Sometimes you need to throw a punch and have it land real hard so the bosses know who's boss, right? Sometimes you just need to shut it down because you can and teach them a lesson. Shut it down like they do in France, where they live longer, retire younger, everyone gets paid sick leave, paid maternity leave, paid vacation time, and everybody has, you know, they have a job, but they still have time for themselves, which is why every man has a mistress and the wife is perfectly okay with it because every wife is somebody else's mistress. That's the joy of time for yourself. So we, 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 a nationwide railway strike would have been the best thing to happen to the American people, the best thing to happen to the American people. But both parties, which are beholden to Wall Street and not the workers, Both parties in December of last year were terrified of a national railway strike, partly because of the untold billions that would be lost, but not really. They were terrified of a national railway strike because, like bridge or tunnel repairs that clog traffic for hours, most Americans would come to see National strikes as a necessary inconvenience, right? When they're doing work on the George Washington Bridge and I'm stuck in traffic for three hours, I go, okay, this is a necessary inconvenience. That's what a national strike is, a necessary inconvenience. Right now, most Americans are easily terrified of a nationwide strike because we've never seen one. And fear of the unknown is always far worse than reality. We need a nationwide strike just to show Americans it's great. It's empowering. Once Americans saw that a nationwide strike would bring the rich and powerful to their knees, a vast preponderance of Americans would be energized to wage even more war against the billionaires and corporate scofflaws who take more from us than they give back. Have you ever tasted blood? Try it. You want more. Okay, maybe I t- <laughs> maybe I revealed a little too much about my dietary habits. I'm telling you, once you shut this economy down, and watch Jeff Bezos beg, beg Christian Smalls to bring people back to work, you'd be salivating. Once you taste blood, there's no stopping. The Democrats and Republicans feared a national railway strike because it wouldn't have been as catastrophic as they warned which means there would be more, right? I, I'm old enough to remember the first time the Republicans shut down the government and we were warned, oh my God, they're going to shut down the government. Everything will stop. Well, it is horrible to shut down the government, but, you know, we survive. If they shut it down again, we'll survive. We, sh- we us, the people, the 99%, uh, shut down the economy. Maybe Jeff Bezos won't survive. Maybe he'll have to sell one of his yachts. But not only will we survive, we'll thrive. But they were terrified of a national railway strike. And that is why the joint congressional resolution Biden signed in December, forcing the railway workers back to their jobs. That's why that resolution 
makes it a federal crime for the railway workers to go on strike while this new contract is in effect. You should try a strike. You need to form a union to enjoy a strike. It's great. Strikes are great. It's sexy. It's it's sexy. It taps in to the uh, America. It really does. Joe Biden wants us. That's the same Joe Biden who whose first fundraiser was held uh, sponsored by a union busting law firm. It might have been the same law firm that John Stewart used over at The Daily Show. John Stewart's a union buster. I think he used I know when I was having trouble with John Stewart through the Writers Guild, they told me John Stewart hired, hired one of the top union busting attorneys. I think they said he was out of Philadelphia. That's who John Stewart used. Anyway, Joe Biden, what, what, John Stewart from The Daily Show. Joe Biden wants us to think he's pro-union because he constantly reminds us he supports the PRO Act. Supporting the PRO Act and passing the PRO Act are two different things. There's only one way to pass the PRO Act. It's the same way we outlawed child labor and got the 40 hour work week. Shut it all down. Shut it all down because we can let the bosses know who's boss. Trust me, if we shut it all down, you'll survive. As a matter of fact, if we don't occasionally shut it all down, we won't survive. Viva la France. I'm David Feldman. Join me for office hours every Friday night. It starts at 6 p.m. Eastern. I will be there from 8 till 930 Eastern. And I can tell you about Jon Stewart and his union busting activities over at The Daily Show. If you're interested, talk. I have a small little show here and uh, I'll tell you whatever you want to know about unions or you tell me what I should know about unions. In order to get the invitation for office hours, go to my website. And while you're over there, sign up for my newsletter. I'm David Feldman, reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. And shut it all down. See, I'm going to shut it all down right now. It's going to feel great. Watch, I'm shutting it all down. All right, is Texas leaving? We're going to find out. It's time once again for Howie Klein. Howie Klein is on the line. Howie Klein is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America Pack. They raise money for progressive candidates all around America. Read him every day over at Down With Tyranny. It's been too long. Howie, we're going to talk Yo. about Thomas Lee, who committed suicide. We'll end up at the end. We'll talk about him. We'll talk about Texas maybe seceding, maybe we hope <laughs> they go, uh, and CPAC. Let's start well, off. We, well, no, 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 no. We don't want the whole state to go. We, I mean, you know, obviously we don't want uh, Houston and Dallas and Austin and San Antonio and El Paso. We don't want places like that to go. But the rest of it, if they want to go and, and they want to vote on that, they, they, they want to have a referendum, let them go and let them take Marjorie Taylor Greene and her <laughs> people with them. Them. I mean, the country would be far better off with uh, uh, the, you know, the U.S. would be far better off with these red counties that are a bunch of hell holes where they're, they're unvaccinated, where they're all Trumpists, uh, a bunch of neo-Nazis. Let them go. Gay gesund. I hate. <laughs> and they're takers. The great myth about them, right, is all the people who want to leave and complain about welfare. Th- these are taker states or taker counties. Yes, that's right. They're, they're, they're almost, I mean, you know, they're not, it's not Atlanta. It's not the, it's not the places that are, uh, that are producing, uh, uh, it's it, right. It's the takers. The, these red counties are hell holes and they, they want to go. God bless them. Let them <laughs> fuck them money to go, pay them to go. I hope we'll starve and we'll never have to. 
hear about them again. And they can have all the guns they want. They can shoot each other all day and all night. The more the merrier. You can all run around without vaccinations and get every disease on the face of the planet. Right. We'll keep Austin. And you said Atlanta. I'm wondering why, we're, why I'm carrying on like this. And the reason is because uh, today is the 187th um anniversary of the uh, the fall of the Alamo. So uh, a state legislator, one of the most backward people in government anywhere in America, this fat little uh, pastor who <laughs> got elected with 80% of the vote, although this year he didn't even have to face a Democratic challenger. No one, no one challenged the guy because the district is so backward. And it, 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 it's like east of... Um, East of Dallas. In any case, this guy uh, introduced thought that, you know, since it's the 187th uh, anniversary of the Alamo, what better day to introduce uh, a, a, um, a bill to have a referendum on secession? <laughs> no, he's a, he's a known troublemaker. He, he is the guy who introduced the bill in Texas to um, to declare abortion so criminal that if a woman and her doctor, if she got an abortion and he or she performed the abortion, they would be executed or they could be executed. Right. But that's, that's this guy. But he's all, obviously, I mean, you, you, you probably already guessed he's also the one introducing the bill to ban uh, drag shows. Right. <laughs> I mean, what, what can you say? Let them go. They, let them go. Let them go have their own country. They won't have any drag shows and they'll be, all, and they'll all be happy until they all die. Right. I, I, you know, we taught them this during the civil war. And they didn't learn. No, we made a big mistake during the Civil War. We, 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 we forced them to stay. Right. That was the biggest mistake we ever made. And we burnt Atlanta. There were other parts of the South that we should have lit up. But uh, Atlanta learned its lesson. You know, total war. There's a lot Atlanta, to be, lots to be said. Wonderful, uh, loyal uh, city with full, full of fantastic people, and as is Savannah, as is Augusta, as is Macon, as is Columbus. There are wonderful places in Georgia, and they'll stay with, with the union. They'll decide they want to stay with the union. And let all those backward places that elect people like Marjorie Trader Green, let them go with Bobby Slayton's district in Texas. Goodbye. <laughs> Good riddance. I really say we should pay them to go. We should offer them incentives to go so we don't have to put up with them anymore. They have made this country so much worse than it could be. This could be a great country. And without them, this would be a great country. Let them yeah. go. And, and anyone who wants to, you know, the 15% of people who didn't vote for uh, 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 Slayton, let them, uh, you know, let's help them move to a normal place. There is a problem because of globalization. Somebody like me, somebody like you, people who are in the media no longer have to worry about what the red states think. We play to a much larger audience right now and we can call them what they are. Now, like you said, not everybody in these red states is mentally, emotionally and psychologically inferior, but a vast proportion. That's why I say states. That, that's, right. that's why I'll never say states. That's why I never say states. Um, right. You know, when you get down to a granular, granular level on counties, it's a much different situation. You know, the counties, the, the three counties in Slayton's district, uh, you know, there you got like lunatics. They're all crazy and they should all go. Yeah. Whereas Texas, we love, we love Texas. Texas is, is filled with fantastic people. Mm -hmm. And they would agree so with the us. millions of they would agree with Texas. us. The people in Texas yes. who listen to this show agree with us. They've had it with these subhumans, these Neanderthals. And like I said, the marketplace has changed where people like us no longer have to worry what these inferior people think of us. They are inferior. And we can now call them that unapologetically. CPAC. Did you watch CPAC, C CPAC and is Matt Schlapp? Is it over for Matt Schlapp? I hope so. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, Matt Schlapp, of course, is denying everything. <clears throat> Everyone knows it, it's true. Everyone knows that he grabbed this guy's uh, penis and uh, wouldn't let go. And, uh, you know, Matt Schlapp is what Matt Schlapp is. And, but he'll deny it, deny it, deny it. And the right wingers don't care what's, the, what's the reality. They just care that he's on their team. That's enough for them. Well, it was empty this time, wasn't it? 
Well, not really empty. You know, it was uh, it wasn't full. That's for sure. I, you know, it, it, people say that uh, tr- when Trump spoke, which they expected to be full, uh, there was uh, the room was half filled. Other people said it was two thirds filled. I saw the pictures. It looked pretty bad. I mean, yeah. it really did look half half filled. Yeah, but I wasn't there. No, I saw the pictures too. It looked almost as empty as the space between his ears. Let's go back to Matt Schlapp because he got fired by Coke Industries, according to the Washington Post, because he was rude and insensitive as a lobbyist for Coke Industries. If Coke, if the Coke brothers find you disgusting, how disgusting a human being could you? I mean, well, they, I, think, I, I don't know how much that they found him disgusting as they found him ineffective. You know, in other words, he couldn't get anything done for them because everyone hates him. Well, no, he was accused of sexism and allowing a racist uh, workplace. And and supposedly CPAC, surprise, surprise, is a racist and sexist workplace. Hard to believe. There yes, and they glory in it. Yeah. It shouldn't, it shouldn't surprise us. Any You write about the straw poll Trump won the straw poll at CPAC. Yes, of course. By, I think he got 60% or 62%, something like that. I, I'm away from my office as we're talking. I'm, I'm in my kitchen now. It, it, the smell of the uh, corn chowder just like drew me into the kitchen. Have you ever <laughs> made corn chowder? I'm making seitan tonight. Have you ever made seitan? This is my new obsession. Of course, I love seitan. But have you ever made corn chowder? No. I'm going to give you the secret of, of how to make a great corn chowder. And so everyone who's listening who wants to know how to make a great, a great corn chowder, I used to be a chef, so I know this stuff. Okay. When you, when you take the, uh, the kernels off the cobs, don't throw the cobs away. Cut the cob in half, and then when you're seeping the soup all day, or however long you're going to do it, in, in the, you know, I, I, I use oat milk, which is fantastic, Right. And, and when you when you do that, you put the cobs in and you let the uh, the oat milk um, diffuse into the cob and the flavor of the cob diffuses into the oat milk, actually. And you don't eat the cobs, of course, but the, it, it gives you the, the most delicious corn flavor. OK, sorry for that. <laughs> That's the, that might be the most important thing, <laughs> the most important piece of information uh, we, we've conveyed Uh Let's go back to especially for the people who live in in those red counties where they have lots and lots of corn. What? Yes. Which they use for things (laughs) also use for things other than eating. Uh, They they use. Yes. Match lap, for example. Yes. (laughs) Match lap. Head of CPAC. Any surprise speeches? Was there anything there that was so offensive? It surprised you. Were you surprised? Uh, no, it, 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 no, absolutely not. I mean, it, it was all as as expected. They, yeah, were they crazy and insane? Absolutely. Uh, you know, and you had all the nuts. That you know, there's uh, Marjorie Trader Green and Lauren Boebert and uh, Matt uh, Matt Gates. I mean, it's like a caricature of exactly what you would expect it to be. Right, right. And Trump, you know, Trump making a fool of himself. Ron DeSantis was noticed. They, they, they love what, the kind of stuff that he does. They just think it's the greatest. Yeah. So good. God bless. Let Ron, them go. Ron DeSantis, not, is- not at CPAC. <laughs> why wasn't, that, sorry, Teddy. why wasn't uh, Ron DeSantis at CPAC? And is he going to go up against Trump? He was at the Reagan library. Yeah. He yeah. will go up against Trump. He's doing all the things. I mean, he has a campaign already to go. I mean, they're they're already working. He's uh, raising money all over the country for Republican organizations, and as well as for himself. He's absolutely running. So anyone who says he's he, he's not going to run is wrong. And uh, you know, Trump is hoping that if he insults him enough, he'll scare him. He'll scare him off. But I don't think at this point he's going to be scared off. He's running. You? And, uh, you know, I think Trump will probably, probably slaughter him. I mean, the, the Republican uh, establishment, depending, well, let's put it like this. The old Republican establishment wants DeSantis. The new Republican establishment is MAGA, and, and they won't have it. 
you know, the best thing that could happen, which I don't expect will, but the best possible thing that could happen is that um, DeSantis wins and Trump runs, uh, runs a, 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 you know, an independent campaign. Which he is not. And I, he is not. Sorry. He is not said that he wouldn't do that. Right. He won't make. The no, no. I mean, they, they force him into uh, agreeing that uh, he'll support whoever wins the nomination. Uh, you know, they say that if you don't sign an agreement to that effect, uh, you can't debate in or in see um, debates. But I don't uh, I, I, I don't see I don't see Trump signing something like that. And if they're not, you know, if, if they don't want to have him in the debates, I mean, no one will watch the debates. He can have his own uh, his own infomercial instead, and I'll watch that. In order to up against it, in, in order to participate in the debates, which I think are later this year, like August of this year. First one is in August. That's right. You have to promise that you will support the whoever gets the the nomination. Right, and, and Trump is saying he won't. He, he's saying that it depends who wins the nomination. I'm not just going to say yes to anybody. And then a number of others are saying the opposite in a way, or well, the same thing in some ways that they're not they're not going to support Trump. So they don't want to sign it either. So it's a, it's a it's a kind of an interesting thing that the R the RNC has made for itself a, a little uh, a little trap. I don't know how they're going to get out of it. How much of this reminds you of 2016, where a lot of people. Yeah, saying, tremendously. I'm sorry. Tremendously. Everybody's saying he's a bridge too far, can't support him. The minute he starts racking up primaries, people are going to fall in line, won't they? I think so. Yes. I mean, you know, there were some differences between now and then, but I, I think that they're uh, they're not profound enough to make a difference. I that's why I think Trump is going to beat DeSantis. And he will be their nominee. And that's the only possible way that Biden can win. You know, you meant, did, did I, when we were talking earlier, you had said something about uh, uh, Glendale and how I had gone to see Bernie. Mm-hmm. So it was amazing to see the vigor and the energy that Bernie had. He came bounding out onto that stage. He There was no chair. He just stood up for the whole 90 minutes and talked and, and, you know, brilliantly and with great enthusiasm. I mean, and and to look at him and then to look at Biden, I mean, Biden couldn't last doing that for like five minutes. Uh, And and, I mean, Biden is a, is a year younger than Bernie and, and Biden seems he's 20 years older than Bernie. Right. Uh, It's just amazing. I should also tell you that people were coming up to me uh, at that thing. And uh, although Mostly they asked me if they could take a selfie with me, which was like shocking and wow. scared the people who were with me. But uh, so many people said, when are you going to be back on David Feldman's show? <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> you, That's you, you have a lot of followers in Glendale, apparently. Well, no, I think you're pretty, uh, pretty popular. You're, you're, uh, I don't want to get into it, but you're incredibly popular. So I what, eat there a lot. What did, what did Bernie talk about in Glendale? I know that he was on the Bill Maher show. What else did? Yeah, he talked about a lot of the things he said on the Bill Maher show. And Captain, you know, basically, uh, you know, he, you know, he didn't have a, you know a racist asshole asking him questions like mm-hmm. the, like he had on the Bill Maher show, but but you know his shtick was going to be the same. He talked about the stuff that's in the book. You know, for example, he he he, he began by talking about. Uh, how the, the the political media is a joke, and they don't really uh, report on politics; they report on gossip. And I, I did a little post about that today as well, right. because it's obvious the case. They, uh, you know, they, they, there's never any discussions about policy. You watch the talking head shows uh, on Sundays, and you know, it, it's a pure gossip, no, nothing to do with policy whatsoever, and, yeah. which is a shame. You know, because they have some fairly smart people asking the questions and they never ask smart questions. I was reading an article about AI and right now they can fake video and audio of candidates saying whatever you want them to say, which means scandals by 2024 will be deniable. You can just plausibly say that's not me saying I grab women's pussies without permission. Trump could now say that wasn't my voice. 
That's good. For, you could say yeah, AI did it. Yep. Yeah, AI. But isn't that good for our country when we can get rid of all these scandals that mean nothing and focus on policy? If if adultery and uh, saying racist or sexist or anti-Semitic things, which are horrible, but if they can be explained away and blamed on AI. It forces us and the candidates to only talk about policy. Isn't that a positive? Well, we, I know what you mean, David, and policy is really important, but character is important as well. So, uh, you know, I mean, the fact that Trump is a racist and a sexist and, uh, you know, a, a crook, uh, all that stuff is also important. I mean, when does Trump, Trump is not a serious policy guy. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be very, very hard. You know, even if he says the right things, and, and he does sometimes, compared to other Republicans, he sometimes says the right things in terms of policy, like let's not touch Social Security and Medicare, and let's not, uh, you know, that that kind of thing is, is, is differentiates him from other Republicans, certainly from Ron DeSantis. But does he mean it? Of course, he doesn't mean it. He would. You know, that not, I mean, so arguing about policy without taking into account. Uh, character is a problem. Well, I, I know what you mean, and I don't disagree with you about what's important. But you know, uh, on the other hand, you know, I mean, tr- even if Trump, I mean, Trump is an outlier. That's for sure. There's no one else like him. But he has made he has given permission for people to be like him, and there are more people like him than there ever were before. I mean, what is what is Marjorie Trader Green? What is that thing like that doing in Congress or Lauren Boebert? It's it's horrifying that people like that are actually in our government. It's, it's scary. And that's why I'm, you know, part of why I'm saying, let them go. Let those counties that elect those people, au revoir. Take, right. you know, give them money, let them go, make it easy for them. Should we ignore Marjorie Taylor Greene? Because she is such a joke mm-hmm. and she's so stupid and vile. But she... <laughs> Well, it's hard to ignore her because she's enjoyable on, right. on a certain level. Also hard to ignore her uh, because those, their people don't. They take her very seriously. I mean, everything that you are saying about her, they'll say about the kind of people who you like. I mean, they certainly, you know, they'll say exactly the same thing about AOC, for example. Um, so when you say, should we ignore them? You know, no, let them have their own country and, you know, we can watch from afar. Uh, it would be so much better off that way. But when you when you look, us. when you write about her, do you feel sorry when you write about her or George Santos? Do you feel, pardon the pun, it's low hanging fruit that it's too easy or yes. is it, 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 you, it is too easy. And yet it's too easy to talk about Donald Trump. But he is a cons- yes, we, uh, he's consequential. <laughs> It's important also to talk about these people. You know, I, I was, Roland told me last night uh, about how, um, you know, I've been saying how uh, George Santos has never met someone and befriended them who he didn't steal from. <laughs> Even if it was just a scarf, he stole from everyone he ever knew, everyone. Mm-hmm. And Roland, did you hear that he was get, he was stealing people's, um, information so that he could he could take he could empty their accounts at their a, at ATM machines, and I, I I hadn't read about that at the time, and and you know that again that is that policy no that's the kind of people that are are, are Republicans he is what a Republican is he has stole stolen money clothing jewelry everything he get his hands on for his entire life his entire life. And that is who got elected in, in, a, in a swing district in Nassau County. Now, I mean, this is unrealistic, but I don't think anyone who voted for him, should, they should all have a timeout, like a 10-year timeout of no voting. And, and Elise Stefanik should have a timeout for endorsing him. And, and, st- and sticking with it. Right. <laughs> She's still sticking with it. So in the end, you say character counts, but... If you're part of the ruling class, you know that Donald Trump is a thief, but he gave you that big tax cut in 2017. Do you does it really? What, ma- Republican, wouldn't, what Republican wouldn't give you that uh, big tax cut? You I mean, that's what they're about. 
That I mean, that is what conservatism is, is, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, conserving the social order a- as it is. So, you know, of course you give tax cuts to the rich that's where, or any Republican would do that. And that's why the rich, the very, very wealthy Republicans don't want him anymore. Well, I mean, they may want him, but they feel he can't win. And they're probably right. And they, they would rather have DeSantis. And what is DeSantis offering the very wealthy other than a nasty culture war that I guess benefits the wealthy because it divides us? What, what, what does DeSantis yeah. offer? That Trump does. Tax cuts to the rich and, and, you know, doing away with programs that cost them money. DeSantis is, you know, he's a hardcore right wing Republican and always has been. You talked with our friend Alan Grayson about what uh, DeSantis is doing to Florida. What does Congressman Grayson, what, what is his assessment of the, the four years of damage under DeSantis? Yeah, you, 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 you have to ask him, but he's, uh, you know, he's pretty distraught about it and, uh, you know, and tries to, you know, tries to joke when he can. But, you know, he sees what's happening to his state and he's not happy. Well, the rich. But go ahead. I was going to say that's what's hap- That's what Florida has become suddenly. I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't always that way. Uh, and again, you know, it, I mean, it's it, 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 it's. There are, there are more of them than there are of us, yes, but it's not that it's not that imbalanced. I mean, there are millions and millions and millions of wonderful Floridians who are loyal Americans, and they're they're stuck in that that hellhole uh, of a d- dystopia right now. What is the mentality that that they 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 feel lousy and they want everybody else to be as miserable as they are? What is the psychology of these? You know, the the Republicans have, uh, you know, or conservatives, I should say, historically have um, felt that the masses shouldn't be educated and only the elite should be educated. And uh, and, And they've done everything to destroy the American educational system, public education system. And, you know, they, it succeeded. They, they, they have a really, really stupid electorate and, uh, and it's gained ground. And that, that's the MAGA movement. That's what it is. These people are morons. You, you, you watch CPAC and, and your jaw just drops. Listening to these imbeciles like Marjorie Trader Greene speak and Matt Gates speak. I mean, Matt Gates is, is you know, college educated from a, a wealthy family. Uh, but, you know, has decided that playing the role of psychopath is uh, beneficial to his career. And are we doing a disservice by calling these people stupid? I could hear Bernie saying, don't do that. Don't call these people stupid. Don't call them lazy. Yeah. Don't call them ignorant. But you can't use, use too broad of a brush. So you can't, you know, say things like, you know, everyone in Texas is stupid because that's insane. They're, they're not. The people who live in Texas are not stupid. But um, the MAGA people, yeah, they're stupid. Otherwise, they wouldn't be MAGA people. Yeah, yeah. Well, before you go, let's, if you have time, I, I want to ask you about the wealthy. You, you had an interesting piece about, uh, I think his name is Thomas Lee, Hedge fund manager worked with Bain Capital, and he committed suicide at the age of seventy-eight last week. Right, he didn't work with Bain Capital in his own thing, but his company and Bain Capital. The way the re- one of the reason I know of him is because they are the ones that uh, took um, they took over Warner Brothers Records. I see. Uh, Warner Brothers Records was part of Time Warner and um, an AOL Time Warner, and then. Uh, they, they did a leverage buyout of the, of the record company and then destroyed the record company. And it was at one time the greatest record company that ever existed. And now it's just a, you know, a corporate entity that doesn't mean anything. It's just another one that's exactly the same as all the other companies. No difference, no personality, and no reason to go to one or the other. They're all the same. And I have a picture from so Down With Tyranny. That. I have a picture from Down With Tyranny of... Bill Clinton in a golf cart, and I'm assuming that is... Driving him around. (laughs) I'm sorry? 
<laughs> he's driving. Uh, he's driving Lee around. Yeah, he's driving Thomas Lee around. So this must have been, yeah. you know, twenty years ago. The the whole raison d'etre of the right is to pass their billions on to their idiot kids. But when you talk to anyone in the mental health field, they all say it never ends well for the kids. This whole idea of inheritance and uh, primogeniture, if you want to call it that. So you wrote about the wealthy and and you wrote, I don't have it in front of you, but you pretty much said the, the wealthy are only good for their art collection. That's the only good they do is collect art. But they deprive it yeah. from us. They deprive it from us because. No, no, no. Uh, eventually, it, the stuff winds up in museums, uh, fortunately. And, and in his case, he was giving, you know, you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of art to museums. So, so you know, that, that was the good part about it. But there were lots and lots of bad parts about it. I mean, he, he was the one, he, he developed the model for leverage buyouts. Uh, you know, and le- what a leverage buyout does, just for people who who aren't thinking about that or don't know about it, a, a company will go in and they'll use debt to buy to buy a company. Um, so, in other words, someone like Thomas Lee, uh, uh, like a vulture like him, will swoop in, buy a company, not even using his own money, and then they fire lots and lots of people, get the head count down, make the company look uh, really good on paper for a year or two. In his case, it was a year and then sell it for a giant profit before it collapses, which it did. Right. Uh, you know, uh, people in- interested at all the topic could go back to that post. I think I wrote it yesterday yeah. uh, where I talk about it. Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> Yeah, and and there were there were a bunch of tangents off it as well that that I, that I thought would be entertaining. I wound up living uh, on Beekman on Beekman Place, which is a two block long part of Sutton Place with Berman. Uh, the Sutton Place. Susan Berman was a friend of mine. She had a mansion in uh, San Francisco and this incredible apartment right near where Thomas Lee lived. And uh, you know, everyone there was, was everyone she- was famous. Well, she was murdered by, by Durst, yes. Um, but but at, at one time, Susan and I were best friends when I was living in San Francisco. We were very, very close. And uh, so when she would go to New York, which she did often, I would uh, house sit or mansion sit in Pacific Heights. And when I would go to New York, I would stay in this place where, you know, only multimillionaires lived. At a time in my life when I had to make a decision every week do I put gas in my car or do I eat? So I was like very, very poor. I was paying $90 a month rent. And yet here I knew this, this person who, I mean, when she wanted to take me someplace, she would buy me clothes. So I would fit in with everybody else. Cause I didn't have that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, you know, I got to her parties and everyone there was like, you know, wealthy and famous. I mean, in a, mostly in a bad way. She was the, um, the daughter of, of a mafia Don. And that's how she got her money as well. Although a Jewish mafia she, she don. Was, sorry, say it again. A Jewish mafia don. Yes, in fact, he was known as Davy the Jew. That, that's what he, <laughs> he was. He was a mafia don in Vegas. Uh, David Berman, who was known as David Davy the Jew Berman. You sleep with the, you, you sleep with the white fishes. If uh, go ahead, yeah, he was he, sleeping he, with the fish. And, and he was he was murdered. He, he was murdered and. Her mother was murdered as well, and she inherited the money. Uh, so, so, and then eventually um, she lost it all, and she was basically, you know, had nothing. I mean, I mean, nothing at all. She was living on, uh, you know, people's uh, generosity. In fact, at one point when Roland was putting himself through college, he was working at um, a Starbucks or, or some, I think Starbucks, yeah. And he said, he came in one day and he said, is that Susan Berman? Is she a friend of yours? You know, someone named Susan Berman. I said, yeah, of course. She's a very old friend. He said, well, she's on a list of uh, check bounces. We're supposed to like call the police if she comes into the store. Would you so say she went from like literally being a multimillionaire to being someone impoverished who had nothing, who was living uh, in places that people would let her stay at. Okay. Before you go, you, you saw Berman. 
Bernie is very much like Trump. You, you saw Bernie speak in Glendale. He has a new book out about capitalism. Is it, yes, is it fair? Me, I mean, I got to get a ticket. You get a copy of the book. Is it so fair? I have a copy of the book now. Is it fair to say that Bernie is worth a couple of million dollars? I, I've been told he is. And, and people use. I don't know. I mean, if, you, if you've seen it, then maybe. But I, I, I don't think I have seen that. But it's possible. With his homes and stuff like that. And people say to me, aha, he's a hypocrite. Why is it not? Hip, why is it not hypocritical that Bernie at 80 is worth uh, a couple of million? He's comfortable. Why is that not hypocrisy? It is not hypocrisy. Uh, Explain why. It's not hypocrisy. I don't know why it would be hypocrisy. Well, that's well, what people use. Why they think it is. People say. I, mean, I, I know in my own life, I grew up in a, in a working class family. And, and my grandfather, who came to America when he was 15, with no money, uh, wound up starting a, a little manufacturing company. And, the, and the fir- some of the first lessons in my life were from him teaching, telling me how the people who work for him had to be treated like family uh, and had to be you know, given a, 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 fair, a fair living. And otherwise, otherwise his company would be worth nothing. And that was the kind of, uh, you know, and now he was a socialist. He was a socialist his whole life. And yet he was also someone, he never got really wealthy, but he was comfortable. And he had, he had, a, he had his own company. So, you know, I don't think that, uh, the, the kind of, I, first of all, I don't know that Bernie, Bernie is wealthy. I'll take your word for it, but it, 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 there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with being successful. There's something wrong with, um, being a billionaire. That right. there, there's something wrong there. It's the concentration I don't of think- wealth. We're not talking about taking away your animal spirits to succeed. We're talking about the stifling of competition and the hoarding of wealth. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the, the, there's only opportunity. It's very limited. It's, it's, I read somewhere now in order to get your kid through a four year college, uh, they're, they're, like, what is it now? Like quarter of a million dollars, half a million dollars to, to send kids to a prestigious college. This is, yeah, it depends on the college, but yes. And that's you, right. And your exposure to the very rich, they aren't happy, are they? Their kids are not happy, are they? Uh, some of them are. <laughs> oh, damn it. I yeah. wanted to end on but a both- upbeat note. I, <laughs> they're all like the Murdoff family, right? Uh... I, I finally got. I finally started following the the Murdoch trial. Uh, oh, that trial! What, why? What was what was it about? What was it about that trial that made it so interesting and put it on TV all the time? Right, I f- was yeah. fighting it with everybody who brought it up on this show, and I was wrong. Over the weekend, I read up on it, and it is uh, uh, paradigmatic of. Our culture, you know, it's it's it is a dynasty in a small town in South Carolina that can they own the police, they own the banks, they own the judicial system and they can murder people with abandon. So it, it is including themselves, apparently. I'm sorry, what? Including themselves, apparently. Including themselves, apparently. So I apologize to my listeners who were following the trial. I was wrong. It, it, it's not sensationalism it is uh it's america it really is so i was wrong for trivializing it howie klein founder treasurer of the blue america pack read him every day over at down with tyranny so great talking more than one day. I'm by sorry? the way uh, and do we have uh, maybe coming on i saw you wrote to her yes and i haven't heard back so it's a maybe oh. for maybe but maybe, maybe next week we'll have maybe. Maybe. We'll talk okay. to you next week. Great. Thank you so Bye. much, Howie Klein. Follow him on Twitter at Down With Tyranny. And seriously, read him every day over at uh, Down With Tyranny. 
If you enjoyed this portion of the David Feldman Show, please subscribe to this channel. And the only reason you're listening to this show is because your friends copied uh, the link and pasted it on social media or in an email so their friends could find out about it. So much love. I'm feeling so much love. The, hi, so much love. The Biden administration revealed today that a pro-Ukrainian group was behind last year's attack on the Nord Stream pipelines, and that pro-Ukrainian group would be the Biden administration. As many as 3.5 million French citizens took to the streets to protest a government pension reform proposal that raises the retirement age to 64. Garbage went uncollected, police fired tear gas at unarmed civilians, and a third of all flights going in and out of the country were canceled. That pretty much sounds like every day in New York City without the strikes. This is what democracy looks like, what's going on in France. You have 3.5 million protesters. Some of them were troublemakers. They set fire to garbage cans and broke windows, but not a single protester shot and killed. Why is that? No guns. Although things did get ugly when French President Emmanuel Macron had enough with protesters outside the presidential palace. So to shatter the angry mob's resolve, he ordered in his notorious Josephine Baker Brigade to let loose with a four minute dance sauvage. Yes, that is uh, definitely the Josephine Baker Brigade letting loose with a four minute <laughs> dance sauvage. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan announced that he would not seek the 2024 Republican nomination for president. Donald Trump is so disappointed because he already picked out a nickname and that nickname was going to be Maryland Governor Larry Hogan. Wow, that is really vicious to call Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan. That is very cruel. Well, CPAC met all last week in Washington, D.C. Embattled head of CPAC, Matt Schlapp. Matt Schlapp is accused of sexual misconduct with another man, which might explain why Matt Schlapp took to the stage on opening night to announce this year's CPAC theme had been changed at the last minute from Keeping America safe to Matt Schlapp can't get enough of those big ass lady bosoms. OK, so I guess that means he's innocent if they if he can't get enough of those big ass lady bosoms. He didn't pound that man's junk. But according to The Washington Post, remember that male Herschel Herschel Walker staffer who is suing, claiming that Matt Schlapp, quote, pounded my junk, right? According to the Washington Post, that male staffer is not the only one to complain about Matt Schlapp's behavior in the workplace. Former CPAC employees complain, according to the Washington Post, that Schlapp created a hostile work environment that was sexist, homophobic, and racist. Shocking. Hard to believe that people who went to work for CPAC, an organization dedicated to promoting intolerance towards women, the LGBTQ community, and people of color, hard to believe that they would find themselves treated poorly just because they were a woman, a member of the LGBTQ community, or a person of color. What are the odds? What are the odds? Before running CPAC, Matt Schlapp worked for the Koch brothers, where he was forced to leave under a cloud of workplace discrimination. Do you realize how loathsome an individual you must be for the Koch brothers to find you repulsive? Matt Schlapp 
was literally too skanky for the Koch brothers. Because Matt Schlapp has been accused of sexually assaulting another man, attendance at CPAC this year ended up lighter than his loafers. This picture clearly demonstrates how small the crowd was for Donald Trump's big speech. But Sean Spicer came out after Trump spoke and insisted Donald Trump's speech was the largest attended CPAC speech in history, period. Look at this picture. The room looks emptier than the space between Jimmy Dore's ears. Far-right fascist, racist, and mortal danger to freedom-loving Americans, Steve Bannon was there. And as you can see, Steve Bannon is starting to look as ugly on the outside as he is on the inside. To refresh your memory, after receiving his pardon from Donald Trump, Bannon was found guilty of contempt of Congress and is awaiting sentencing. And he is also on trial in New York for defrauding a charity whose money was supposedly going towards building the wall. Wasn't Mexico, wasn't Mexico supposed to pay for the wall? Maybe the only people who donated to the charity were Mexicans. Maybe that's how it worked out. Speaking of the wall, Doug Freemason attended CPAC wearing a suit that not only looked exactly like Donald Trump's wall, but also smelled like the Rio Grande. An hour after this picture was taken, Doug stripped down to his boxers after someone checked the suit's label and discovered it was made in China. For only five dollars, for only a five dollar donation to the Republican Party, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott will let you take a selfie with him to prove you're not a racist. A lot of Republicans needed three arms for that picture with the African-American senator. Yes, three arms, one to hold the camera, one arm for putting it around the African-American Republican senator. And the third arm, well, that's for keeping a watchful hand on your wallet. Hey, they're not racist at CPAC. They're fiscally prudent. Former crack addict turned pillow magnate and election denier Mike Lindell charges CPAC attendees $200 to get a picture taken with them, $500 not to get a picture taken with them. And Florida Congressman Matt Gates and Donald Trump Jr. were there to tape a live episode of their new talk show for Newsmax, Cracker and the Crackhead. This accessory was a big seller at CPAC this year because it caters to the conservative movement's Christian base by combining the two things Jesus loved more than anything else, guns and gold. One of the favorite exhibits this year at CPAC was a life-size replica of Donald Trump's Oval Office, where visitors could have themselves photographed sitting behind the desk pretending to obstruct justice and incite an armed insurrection while snorting rail upon rail of prescription strength Adderall. Art lovers at CPAC are always looking for something to hang on their walls next to the dead hitchhikers. And <laughs> they, you know, they have the dead hitchhikers <laughs> embalmed hanging on their walls, but they're always looking for some piece of art to hang next to the dead hitchhiker. And here we see two reasonably priced portraits of the son of God. Those are uh, two reasonably priced portraits of the son of God being sold at CPAC. That would be Jesus and Don Jr., who are quite a team. After Jesus makes the crippled girl walk, Don Jr. makes fun of her limp. <laughs> Because he volunteers at 16 separate soup kitchens over the holidays, ultra MAGA election denying anti-vaxxer Fred Jameson of Kingsburg, Alabama, holds the world record for most Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners ruined by a single individual. Congratulations, Fred Jameson of Kingsburg, Alabama. 
and famed South Carolina attorney Alex Murda took time off from serving two consecutive life sentences to deliver for the CPAC crowd a heartfelt sermon on the importance of faith, charity, and family. Several CPAC attendees couldn't wait to show off their Trump tattoos. This is an actual Trump tattoo. It's a little different from the Trump tattoo some of us will be wearing on our arms if Trump is reelected. And that tattoo will just be a series of numbers provided to us courtesy of IBM. That is CPAC 2023. Well, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer took to the well of the Senate on Tuesday to complain about his cable company. Last night, millions of Americans tuned in to one of the most shameful hours we have ever seen on cable television. Really? I mean, yes, we can all agree. Bravo's Andy Cohen is a vile canker sore on American culture. But for the Senate majority leader to wait a second, I'm looking at my notes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, it turns out he was talking and complaining about Tucker Carlson, who spent Monday night cherry picking January 6 security footage given to him by Speaker Kevin McCarthy and using his program to insist the riot on January 6 was not an insurrection. Carlson said that the people who stormed the Capitol were law abiding citizens who were welcomed in by Capitol Police. Now, that's one version of events. But there's another version of events gleaned by forcing people to put their hand on a Bible and swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth or go to prison. See, when you ask people to put their hand on a Bible and tell the truth, you get different results. So far, 518 of Tucker's peaceful tourists have pleaded guilty to some sort of felony, with 60 of them pleading guilty to the federal crime of assaulting a police officer. Meanwhile, three federal trials so far have gotten convictions of seditious conspiracy. So you get a different story when you force people to put their hands on a Bible in a court of law. When you put hands on Bibles in courts of law and force people to swear an oath to tell the truth, a different fruit is yielded. See, when people must tell the truth, when their hand is placed on a Bible, and if they know that if they're caught telling a lie, they get locked up, they tell the truth, which is why even Tucker Carlson said under oath in the Dominion voting machine defamation lawsuit against Fox News, the $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit, according to the deposition, according to Tucker Carlson's testimony under oath, he never for one second believed that the 2020 election had been stolen. That's what he says under oath. But when he's not under oath, when he's just talking to a few million of his illiterate, brain addled, uneducated shut ins who lack all forms of critical thinking and opposable thumbs. Well, when he's just talking to these morons, he says things like this last night. The protesters were angry. They believed that the election they had just voted in had been unfairly conducted. And they were right. In retrospect, it is clear the 2020 election was a grave betrayal of American democracy. Given the facts that have since emerged about that election, no honest person can deny it. No honest person can deny it. That was Tucker last night, not under oath. Under oath, Tucker and all the Fox News hosts, as well as their boss, Rupert Murdoch, they will all say under oath that, yeah, Biden won and he won handily. You really need to read 
the depositions and look through the discovery in this Dominion defamation case against Fox News. The trial starts, I think, next month. It's really interesting. You have Fox News anchors like Brett Baer. This is Brett Baer, who, before becoming an anchor on Fox News, worked in Hollywood as a stunt double for Fred Flintstone. You have in the discovery Brett Baer in a Zoom meeting. You can read the transcripts of Brett Baer right after the 2020 election saying Fox viewers are very upset. Uh, their feelings were hurt. This I'm not making this up. Brett Baer said during a Zoom meeting, according to the discovery in this lawsuit, he said Fox News, Fox News viewers are distraught because Fox called the election for Biden. And Baer says in the Zoom call that the network, Fox News, should take back the call, even though he knew it was 1000 percent accurate, even though he knew the election desk had made the right decision, giving Arizona to Biden. He said, our ratings are down, so we should take back that call. Change the story. This is in the deposition, in the discovery. Change the story. Bear said, let the viewers believe the election was still up for grabs because, quote, we upset our audience. And by upsetting them, by telling them what they didn't want to hear, we are destroying our brand. Our audience is abandoning us. They were their ratings were down after they called the election for Biden. And he said in the meeting, we need to bring our audience back by giving them news they want to hear. I wish I were making that up. Now, keep this in mind. Once you put these professional liars under oath, they tell the truth. Hand on the Bible, they all crack. Suddenly, hand on the Bible, there are no alternative facts. There's no two sides to every story. In a court of law, you tell the truth or you go to prison. And what we are discovering in this Dominion defamation case is that the people on Fox News, they know they're lying. They know they are lying, as well as people who appear on Fox News like Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani lies and he knows he's lying right up until they're in court they continue to lie. Now, Rudy lost something like 50 cases trying to overturn the 2020 election. And he lost each one because he would go before these judges and he never once, not once, claimed voter fraud. Right? He never claimed voter fraud. He would show up, go before the judge, humiliate himself in the courtroom, ending up disbarred, probably in D.C. and New York any day now. He's he's already had uh, his licenses suspended. He's probably going to lose them in D.C. and New York. But but even through Rudy Giuliani's thick alcoholic haze, he knew enough to never, ever tell a judge that there was voter fraud because he knew that was a lie. He knew the judges knew that was a lie. And when you lie like that before a judge, you can get into some serious trouble. So what Rudy did is he went into those courtrooms presenting as Trump's attorney and his job in his adult brain was to just show up and get the attention. That was it. He knew he wasn't going to win any of these cases. His job was to show up, get the attention because he wasn't getting paid. He wanted the publicity to burnish his brand and he would humiliate himself in court. But each time right after court was dismissed, he'd walk outside, get in front of a bank of microphones and go back to lying about voter fraud because he wasn't under oath. Fox News would be different if their reporters had to present the news under oath. 
You want real news? You want to know what's really going on? Watch congressional testimony. Watch C-SPAN. Watch when witnesses are sworn in under oath with the threat of being charged with perjury and sent to jail. This is where the facts are. And that's why you cannot get transcripts of any congressional hearings. You don't believe me? Try. Go online. You're, you're all computer literate. Go online and try to read the transcripts uh, of the House Oversight hearings and the House Judiciary Committee hearings about the weaponization of our government. Go see if you can actually read the hearings. You can't. They would never make those transcripts available to the public. You have to pay for them. <coughs> Excuse me. You have to pay for those transcripts and you have to pay a lot of money. They will not let you go online to read the transcripts, because if you could read the testimony of the people who are testifying before Congress or the comments made by Matt Gates and Jim Jordan, if you could read what they're saying, you would demand they all be arrested. As I said, if you don't believe me, go online and try to read the transcripts from the latest committee hearings. It cannot be done. Well, Republicans like Republican Senator Tom Tillis were asked what they thought of Tucker's big show. Who do you think of, you know, uh, Tucker Carlson got this security footage from Speaker McCarthy and really started to downplay January 6th, said it was, you know, mostly peaceful chaos in his view and said it was not an insurrection, said that Brian Sicknick's death was not related to January 6th. How do you feel about that? I think it's bullshit. Language, language. Uh, Tucker Carlson then thanked Tillis for the compliment and said, if you're ever want to if you ever want to come on my show to promote a fresh conspiracy theory or thinking of a new minority to pick on, the door is always open. Well, what do you think? Have you ever tried to get your hands on congressional testimony? You can't. Can't be done. You got to pay a lot for the transcripts. You can watch it on C-SPAN, but, you know, these hearings take 12 hours. Nobody has the time. Uh, you watch a little of it. You can't read it. If you could read it, it would take, you know, 45 minutes to get through the entire hearings. They won't let you read the transcripts. They won't let you see the transcripts. Uh, transcripts are amazing when you do get to read them. It, they take less time and it means you can hold them in your hands, underline it, you know, and you you're holding proof. The written word is way more powerful than the spoken word. It's why careers are destroyed on Twitter, but not through podcasts. Let me know what you think in the comments section down below. I read all your comments, and uh, you'll know that I read them when you see a heart next to them. That's Some of these platforms allow you to put a heart next to a comment to show that it's been read. I get a lot of information from my listeners, and I thank you for that. And I do issue corrections. So if I said anything factually incorrect, and by the way, I do keep my hand on a Bible throughout this entire show, and I uh, swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Russ. Very generous, Russ. Uh, new technology allows me to see the super chats now at like six in the morning or whatever time it is. Office hours every Friday night. I am there from 8 till 930. I make myself available to all the listeners. You can talk to me about whatever you want. If you have any suggestions for the show, if you have any complaints, uh, compliments, God forbid somebody compliment me. I'm there from 8 to 930. If you would like to come to office hours and talk with me. Please go to my website and you'll see a link for office hours. All you need is Zoom. But if you don't have Zoom, the invitation includes a phone number and you don't have to turn your camera on. You can just lurk. You don't have to participate. You can just watch and meet really interesting people. Some of the best people I've ever met in my life 
show up for office hours. And while you're over my website, please sign up for my newsletter. Comes out every Friday and contained within the newsletter is uh, the the link for for office hours. So please do that. Uh, We're a small little show, so I read your comments and if you want to talk at office hours, uh, I'm there. Uh, It's not like I got anything better to do. And finally, here's some late breaking news. Government isn't the problem. It's the solution. Government isn't the problem. It's the solution. In 1980, Ronald Reagan came to Washington declaring government isn't the solution. It's the problem. Well, we gave it 43 years and now we see what happens when you shrink government, idolize the rich and believe the brain wolves repeating the lie that corporations are more efficient. The lie that corporations can do things better and cheaper than government. It is a lie. I just went to the DMV in Manhattan. It was as pleasant as the post office. And I'm not being sarcastic. I love going to the post office. I love going to the DMV because it works. And I love to see my government work. And no matter how hard Republicans attempt to strip government of its funding, government still works. That's why I want government run health care. When I was at the DMV last week, I kept thinking if only these people handled my paperwork and my health care. Think of your experience America, think of your experience at the post office, the DMV. Think of the Veterans Administration. Compare those experiences to what you have to put up with from Aetna, United Healthcare, Blue Cross, and all those other serial killers. And I mean that. They are serial killers. Who do you want making life and death decisions about your health? about the health of your loved ones? Who do you want? If you think corporations can deliver health care better than the government can, I want you to listen to me. If you think that, you're ignorant. You are ignorant. If you think the current for-profit health care system is superior to government-run health care, You think that because you can't recognize Canada on a map of Canada. You're stupid. You don't read. Your head is filled with banana pudding. And most importantly, sorry, you're worthless and so is your opinion. And quite frankly, I'm almost at a point where... I almost feel you deserve the outcomes that a for-profit healthcare system inflicts upon you. I'm almost there. Almost. I still forgive your ignorance, but trust me, if you think corporations can deliver better healthcare than the government, you are an ignorant, mouth-breathing moron. Now, part of the Democratic Party's platform is a public option for health insurance. It's still in the Democratic Party's platform, and I'm a Democrat. A public option is what Obama initially wanted with Obamacare, but the health insurance companies wouldn't allow it. It never even was up for debate. The public option is not free health care. It's government-run health insurance. It's a benefit that would compete with privately run health insurance companies. That's what the public option is. The public option is you could buy your get your insurance from murderers like United Healthcare, who answer to nobody, 
or you could get your health benefit, your health insurance from the government, uh, which answers to you. If you don't know uh, which is better, you're a moron. Well, why did the health insurance companies kill the public option before Obama even had a chance uh, to take it before the House and Senate? Why? They told him and Pelosi, they said it was unfair. They said, we can't compete with the government. They literally said that. And why couldn't the poor murderers health insurance companies compete with our nasty government because health insurance companies mark up health care at least 25 percent, at least I'm being kind to these pigs who should rot in hell. Medicare has practically no markup and a public option, a health insurance plan offered by our government. Well, it's going to be cheaper because our government doesn't pay $20 million to its CEO and it doesn't spend billions on stock buybacks. It's going to be cheaper and it's going to be better and it's going to be more efficient. That is why Aetna and United Healthcare can't compete with the government. Now, a public option is not government run health care. It's government-run health insurance. Let me ask you, you have parents who are on Medicare. You've tried Medicaid. What would you rather have, government-run health insurance or private, for-profit health insurance? What do you think the end result, the life and death result, is going to be for a government-run health insurance company versus a corporate-run health insurance company. If you think a, you're going to live uh, better and longer through uh, for-profit private health insurance, you're an idiot. Uh, I still believe in democracy and that everybody should vote, but people like you make me question that. I don't know much, but I can assure you, if you think for-profit health care is better than government-run health care. This I am a as sure as today is March 8th, 2023. I am absolutely certain that if you believe for-profit health care is better than government health care, you should be, you're, you're a moron. You're a moron. And you should be reminded every day that you are a worthless moron until you finally come around. <sighs> well, Joe Biden promised in 2020, when Bernie was promising Medicare for all, Joe Biden lied. He's a liar. He lied and said, when I become president, you're going to get a public option. Uh, well, it, it's still in the Democratic Party platform, and it would be cheaper and more efficient and the privately run health insurance companies are still spending millions lobbying against it, playing the victim. <laughs> if only they were with my hands, if I could be alone with the CEO of United Healthcare, I won't tell you what I would do. I, I just I just know that after I was done, I would piss all over him. I, I'm not going to tell you what I would do. But I would finish by pissing all over him in front of his wife and children, the CEO of United Healthcare, whose name escapes me right now. Uh, next show, I'll mention his name. He will say, You can't give the people a public option. That's unfair to United Healthcare. Uh, we can't compete. Yeah, the evil government, right? They can't do anything right. That's what these people try to convince us. The government can't do anything right except bail these golems out when they go belly up. You know, we can't, the government can't do anything right until they crash the economy or their business goes bankrupt and we have to bail them out. The government, they say, is inefficient. 
That's what you've been trained to believe since the Powell memo. And yet, when the post office tries something like public banking, like they once did, you could bank with the post office. Uh, it's been suggested that the, the post office go back to helping the underbanked. Uh, the banks, J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon, they say, that's unfair. And they lobby against it and they kill it. Something like 37 million Americans are underbanked. They can't afford a checking account or a credit card because of the overdraft fees, et cetera, et cetera. And when the government when it suggests that, hey, maybe the government could try to serve the underbanked by having the post office go back to being a bank for these people, the banks say, we can't compete with the government. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Meanwhile, they have all of you convinced that government is inefficient. Headline from the Wall Street Journal. This is the Wall Street Journal, okay? This is today's Wall Street Journal. They are the biographers of greed. They support greed, right? It's the Wall Street Journal. It's owned by Rupert Murdoch. Headline, as customer problems hit a record high, more people seek Revenge. Revenge. Latest edition of a long running survey finds that the share of customers who say they had a service or product problem has doubled since the 1970s. Hmm. Since the 1970s. You mean when the Powell memo was written, which created all this propaganda to convince Americans that Government is bad and corporations are good. Well, it turns out we hate corporations. Let's continue from the Wall Street Journal, right? I will read from today's Wall Street Journal. Americans are encountering more problems with companies, products and services than ever before. And a higher proportion of them are actively seeking <laughs> revenge for their troubles. That's what a new study has found. Some 74% of the 1,000 consumers surveyed said they had experienced a product or service problem in the past year. That is up from 66% in 2020 when the study was last conducted, and 56% in 2017. Only 32% told researchers they had experienced a problem in 1976 when a similar version of the study was first conducted. 1976, that was a few years after the Powell memo, and which, with each passing decade... Americans are brainwashed into believing that government can't deliver anything efficiently. Meanwhile, Americans find themselves more and more frustrated with corporate America and are seeking revenge. You can't seek revenge in the courts, right? Because of the adhesion contracts that they make you sign, right? So you seek revenge, Interesting. The latest wave of research found 79% of customers complained about their most serious problem to the company at fault, an increase from 72% in 2020, and 43% said they raised their voice to a customer service representative to show displeasure about their most serious problem, and that's up from 35% in 2017. People are raising their voice at the customer service representatives when they should be raising their voices at the CEOs and protesting the way they do in France. We should be taxing the CEOs into oblivion. 
It is corporations. It's my waiting on hold. You know, when I get up in the morning, I have calls that have to be made and I dread them. I dread these calls because I know getting one service fee adjusted or a refund or a prescription filled could take anywhere from an hour to three hours because it's corporate America. That's what corporate America does to us more from the Wall Street Journal. At the same time, more companies have been turning to automation <clears throat> to cut costs and cover staffing shortages in their standard customer service. Firms push customers towards phone lines and web chats that are handled by artificial intelligence or other technologies that can respond to basic requests, leaving human staff to handle the more, the more complicated service inquiries. I would never, ever, ever rely on automation to entertain or educate new people. Ooh, trick I. How long are we into the show? Oh, all right, 41 minutes. All right. Uh, what are you going to do? You know corporations suck. They, they suck and they suck the life out of you. They suck your time. Why do you still believe that government is the problem? Government is the solution. Government answers to you if you make it answer to you. Corporations do not answer to you. They don't even answer to their shareholders. They answer to one man or woman, the CEO, who makes off with all the money. Most corporations in America are in debt. They're failing. And they're paying their CEO most of the money because the CEO, his pay is dictated by the board of directors who he gets to pick. Corporations, they're not Apple. Apple is successful. Most corporations are a scam. And the reason you're sitting on hold three hours to get a $5 surcharge reversed is because you don't do what they do in France. Millions, millions take to the street in France and they live longer than we do in France. And compared to our health care, theirs, theirs is free. Their health care is free compared to what we go through. If you're going to get sick, get sick in France. Get it out of your head that government is the problem. We gave it a try. It's the solution. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Please subscribe to this show and uh, hit the like button. The only reason, there's only one reason you're listening to me right now, and that's because one of your friends copied and pasted the link to this show and shared it with you. So if you enjoy any of this, if you learned anything, if I made you angry, I hope I made you angry. You thank me. The best way you can thank me is by copying and pasting the link to this show in an email or on social media to alert your friends to, to share with your friends. That's the best way to thank me. Again, office hours, Friday night. I'm there from 8 till 9.30 p.m. I will talk with you about anything you want, whatever you think I should be covering on the show. As Prince Charles would say, I'm all ears. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak.